Hi, I'm Ben Caldwell. The California BBS puts out official sample questions for the California LCSW Law and Ethics exam, and they tell you what the correct answers are. But they don't tell you why those answers are correct. So today I'm going to tell you why those correct answers are the right answers. We'll talk a little bit about how to think through questions like these on your exam. Here's the first question. A client initiates treatment after the recent death of their spouse. The LCSW's mother also recently died. As the client describes their feelings of loss, the LCSW's own grief is triggered. The LCSW finds it difficult to remain focused on the client during sessions. Which of the following actions should the LCSW take to manage the ethical obligation in this case? A. Disclose personal loss to strengthen the therapeutic bond. B. Explain the personal conflict and refer the client to another therapist. C. Consult with a colleague to address the impact of personal feelings on the therapeutic process. Or D. Discuss the importance of boundaries and refrain from discussing issues that evoke personal reactions. Now, the ethical obligation that you'll find pretty consistently across ethics codes is to monitor yourself for impairment and to make sure that any counter-transference issues that might arise aren't actually interfering with the care of your clients. So when you get questions like this about counter-transference, one of the first things to think about is, is this actually impacting care? All we know so far is that the LCSW finds it difficult to remain focused on the client during sessions. So it's impacting the social worker here a little bit, but we don't know if that's having any kind of a bigger impact on the treatment itself. So with that basis, we can start to look through the response options. Option A, disclose personal loss to strengthen the therapeutic bond. There's a role for self-disclosure in therapy, but here, the client would be put in the position of taking care of the social worker, and so that seems unlikely to be a good fit. Option B, explain the personal conflict and refer the client to another therapist. Again, there are times when referring out is appropriate in response to a counter-transference issue, but that's not your first stop. Your first stop should be, well, is this actually interfering with the care, and are there steps that the therapist can take to address their counter-transference while continuing to provide good quality client care. Here, because we know the LCSW is finding it difficult, but we're not seeing any bigger impact on therapy, it wouldn't be appropriate at this stage to refer the client out to end treatment. That seems like it might be necessary in the future, but it doesn't seem like it's necessary right now. Option C, consult with a colleague to address the impact of personal feelings on the therapeutic process. That's a much better first step to addressing a counter-transference issue. Consult or seek supervision. That way, you have sort of other eyes on the case. Someone else who can give you some feedback on whether this seems to be a situation where referral might be appropriate, or whether the social worker can continue to treat the client managing their counter-transference reactions and have it be good, quality, effective treatment. Option D, discuss the importance of boundaries and refrain from discussing issues that evoke personal reactions. Well, that's just silly, right? Because we're not going to avoid the topic of loss when it's very relevant and present for the client simply because the therapist is also experiencing their own feelings of loss. That would make the therapy very much about the therapist and not about the client, not addressing the client's clinical needs. So given these options, it makes the most sense to me to consult with a colleague to address the impact of personal feelings. And that indeed is the correct answer. Okay, next question. This has to do with the client's sexual history. A client initiates treatment with an LCSW and discloses that they had a sexual relationship with a former therapist. The relationship occurred four years after therapy terminated. That makes this kind of a more complicated question. The client states that they entered the relationship willingly and that the relationship ended amicably. Which of the following actions should the LCSW take to address the legal obligation in this case? Now, you might immediately be thinking, well, I don't know if there's a, a legal violation because 
of the other therapist's actions here, it was more than two years after therapy had ended. Also worth noting, the question itself, which of the following actions should the LCSW take to address the legal obligation in this case? In other words, what do you have to do about it now? The client is showing up in your office having had this prior sexual relationship with their prior therapist. What is the legal obligation for the LCSW today? Option A, maintain confidentiality and give the client the booklet, Therapy Never Includes Sexual Behavior. Option B, maintain confidentiality and encourage the client to press charges against the former therapist. Option C, break confidentiality and confront the former therapist about the unethical behavior. Or option D, break confidentiality and file a complaint of professional misconduct with the licensing board. Let's look at the ones we can dismiss perhaps most easily here. So option C, break confidentiality and confront the former therapist about the unethical behavior. First of all, it's not necessarily your place to determine what's ethical and what's not. But more to the point, the question is asking about your legal obligation. And you do not have a legal obligation to break confidentiality to confront a colleague or another therapist about their unethical behavior. That is not an exception to confidentiality recognized anywhere in California law. There is no obligation on you to do that. So option C is going to be out. Option D, break confidentiality and file a complaint of professional misconduct with the licensing board. Well, remember here, this relationship was four years after therapy terminated. It seems like the client entered willingly, the relationship ended amicably. It's not clear that there actually would be a finding of professional misconduct here, that this would violate the unprofessional conduct statutes that the BBS uses to determine what kinds of behaviors need discipline. So the two options here that include breaking confidentiality, neither one of them is a great option. Let's toss those. And then let's focus on A or B. And I gotta tell you here, I do not like this question because it's, and this happens sometimes with other official sample questions as well, they, the BBS, is getting the legal obligation here a little bit wrong. Option A is maintain confidentiality and give the client the booklet, therapy never includes sexual behavior. Option B, maintain confidentiality and encourage the client to press charges against the former therapist. Both of those include maintaining confidentiality. That's a good start, so we have to look at the pieces that are different. Option A, giving the client that booklet. Option B, encourage the client to press charges. Neither one of those is actually great. If we encourage the client to press charges, we may be imposing on them something that they don't actually want to do. And again, remember that the therapist here may not have violated any of the unprofessional conduct statutes because it was four years after the fact. It's more than two years. So it would be an odd imposition of power for us to encourage the client here to file charges. On the other hand, option A, giving the client the brochure, that's not great either. Because if you actually look at the section of the Business and Professions Code that spells out this mandate, we have to give the brochure to clients who have a sexual relationship or report that they had a sexual relationship with a prior therapist. That mandate only applies if the sexual relationship with the prior therapist occurred during the course of treatment. Now, option A still is the better answer here. There's nothing that ever prohibits you from giving that client that brochure. You could give it to everybody if you wanted to. So option A is the one that the BBS is gonna say is the correct answer here. It is the best option out of the ones available. However, you are not legally obligated in this instance to give the client that brochure. It's just that the other options here are probably worse you can give the client that brochure, but the actual legal obligation is when the sexual relationship with the prior therapist happened during the course of treatment. Okay, last one. Talking about alternatives to medication 
A client dislikes the medication he has been prescribed for his depression. The client asks the LCSW for an opinion about an alternative. Which of the following actions should the LCSW take to address the legal obligation in this case? A couple of things right off the bat. We know we're looking for a legal obligation, not an ethical one. That can be important. And you already should be thinking, if this is a medication issue, what about scope of practice? Because we as master's level mental health professionals, we simply do not make recommendations about medication. So let's look at our options. Option A, remain within scope of practice and refer the client back to his physician. My goodness, right off the bat, that sounds like probably a pretty good option. Option B, educate the client about psychotropics and encourage medication compliance. That one's actually not too bad we can encourage medication compliance. That is within scope. We can encourage clients to take medication as prescribed and to otherwise follow the directions given by their other healthcare providers. Educating the client about psychotropics, that's a little more gray. Um, we don't want to be in the position of educating about things that are outside of our scope. It doesn't mean that we can never have conversations with clients about medication, but those conversations really should be from the standpoint of gathering information, understanding what clients are experiencing on their current medication, maybe so that we can help report things back to their physician and not providing information, making it sound like we are experts in medication because we are not. Medication is outside of our scope. Option C, discuss the risks and benefits of the client's medication and suggest a possible alternative clearly outside of scope. We can knock that one out right off the bat. And option D, obtain a release to consult with the client's physician and advocate for a change of medication. Well, obtaining a release to consult with the physician, that's never going to be a bad thing. We can always try to do that. And that kind of professional collaboration often goes well. But when we are advocating for a change of medication, we are taking on the stance of a medical provider. That simply is not our determination to make. We shouldn't be advocating for a change of medication. What we can do is we can report to the physician what the client says that they are experiencing on this medication. But we shouldn't be telling the physician, in essence, how to do their job. And that's what would be happening here if we're advocating for a medication change. So we come back to A and B. A looks great. It's protecting scope of practice. B isn't awful but that educate the client about psychotropics part gets enough into at least a gray area and, and potentially a not so gray outside of scope area that I would knock that one out as well. And sure enough, option A is the correct answer here. Bear in mind with all of these questions on a law and ethics exam, the BBS is going to key the exam items to specific legal and ethical standards. So as you've seen in the three that we went through here, if you avoid overthinking about the various possibilities of what else might be going on and focus instead on the specific rules that you know apply given a situation, you should be able to take the information in the question itself along with what you know about specific rules and come up with the right answer. I hope this was helpful to you. Once again, I'm Ben Caldwell, and for more information about all of our exam prep programs, please visit highpass.com.